Hi everyone, my name is Zhao Jiawei, and I'm a raster distributed storage en uh, engineer from Dayton Lord. The topic of today's presentation is raster in distributed key value store. We will use the distributed KV engine XLI as an example to explore how to use Rust to develop a distributed KV storage engine. And <clears throat> The content of today's presentation is primarily divided into four sections. The XLI overview and the consistency in weighing, persistent storage, and the deterministic simulation. And all right, without further ado, let's dive into today's topic. First, let's get to know what XLI is. An XLI, it's an open source distributed uh, KV store developed by Datanlore and it was designed for achieving high performance cross data centers, strong consistency. And XLI is comp uh, fully compatible with the ETCD interfaces and provides uh, metadata management across data centers. Written in Rust, XLI adopts the CURB algorithm as its backend consensus protocol. And currently, XLI is also a CNCF sandbox project. And the following two links are the GitHub repository address and the official website of XLI respectively. And uh, XLI can be uh, roughly divided into three layers from top to the bottom, the access layer, uh, intermediate layer, and a persistent layer. The access layer uh, is uh, primarily use the Tonic gRPC framework to receive requests from clients or initiate proposal request to the consensus module. And the intermediate layer can be further divided into the consensus module on the left and the business module on the right. The consensus module adapts, adopts the curve protocol as its consensus algorithm and the bottommost persistent uh, layer is responsible for the persistency of data and metadata in XLI. It can be further divided into uh, two sub layers, the storage API layer and a storage engine layer. And currently, XLI utilizes RocksDB as its underlying storage. Um, so what is the CURP protocol? Before Answering this question, let's first understand some traditional consensus protocols such as the uh, multiplexos and raft. And here is an overview of the simplified multiplexos algorithm process. A client initiates a proposal request to the leader. Upon receiving the request, the leader will execute an accept operation and broadcast it to the other followers in the cluster. When the leader received responses of acceptance from a majority of the nodes, <clears throat> it considered the proposal accepted and response to the client with the chosen proposal. And if the leader doesn't receive enough accepted, uh, accepted responsible, the, uh, it responds to the client with a, pro a proposal failure. And here's an outline of the simplified raft algorithm process. Initially, a client sent a proposed request to the leader of the cluster. Upon receiving this request, the leader invokes append entries to persist the proposal in its old state machine log. And then it broadcasts the uh, append entries request to all followers in the cluster. When a response to, uh, to successful append entries is received from more than half of the nodes, the leader responds to the client with a successful proposal response. If the required number of successful response is not received, the leader responds to the client with a failure proposal response. <clears throat> Be <clears throat> How come the raft and multiplexos needs two RTTs to achieve the consensus? BE multiplexos or raft reaching 
a consensus, reaching consensus inevitably requires two RTTs. Both of them are basic. Uh, both of them are based on a core assumption. The criteria of being durably stored and order must be met after command approval or lock commit. As a result, the state machine can directly perform the approval, uh, approve commands and apply committed locks. <clears throat> Due to the inherent asynchrony uh, of the network, uh, ensuring orderliness is challenging. Therefore, a leader is required to enforce the execution order of different commands and achieve persistency by obtaining replication from the majority through broadcasting. This process cannot be complete in within a single uh, RTT. <clears throat> so we need to consider a question, is a requirement of two RTTs necessary to achieve consensus? Or in other words, is the fulfillment of both being durably stored and being ordered conditions a necessary criterion for consensus. This requires a case-by-case -case analysis. In certain scenario, relaxing the requirements of for ordering does not affect the final result of the state machine, while in other scenarios, it does. Let's examine uh, two specific examples. Suppose we uh, issues, suppose a user issues a put Y5 followed by put Z7 to the cluster. And after the state machine applied this command, uh, ret uh, retrieving the value of uh, Y and Z from the state machine yields Y equals to 5 and Z equals to 7. Now let's reverse the execution order of these two commands. And we observe that even after the state machine applies both commands, the retrieval value for y and z are still y equals to 5 and z equals to 7. This illustrates our earlier point. In certain scenarios, relaxing the requirement for ordering does not impact the cluster ability to reach a final consensus. <clears throat> now let's consider an example where ordering does matter. Assuming that a user issues put Z7 followed by put Z5 to the cluster, And after applying these commands, retrieving the value of z from the state machine yields z equals to 5. However, if we swap the execution order of these commands, of these commands, and upon retrieval, we will find that z equals to 7 in the state machine. This outcome uh, contradicts our initial uh, expectations. It's not difficult to imagine that in such cases, relaxing the order constraint could lead to different nodes in the cluster having different values, thereby compromising final consistency. And the CURB protocol originates from a paper titled Exploiting Communicative for paradigmal faster replication, present at NSDI 2019. <clears throat> the author of this paper are CEO Jim Park, a PhD from Stanford, and a Professor John Osterhout. Professor John Osterhout is also the author of the raft consensus algorithm in a comparison uh, to traditional consensus protocol uh, Kerb's major innovation lies in dividing the consensus scenarios into two categories, the faster path and the slow path. And in the fast path, 
the consensus can be achieved within a single RTT suit for scenarios where uh, ordering doesn't matter. On the other hand, the slow path requires two RTTs corresponding to the situation where ordering does matter. <clears throat> the Curb Protocol introduced the concept of uh, witness. Uh, when a client initiates a proposal, it sends a request not only to the leader, uh, not only to the leader node, but also to all witness nodes. The record within a witness are unordered in the fast path. In the fast path, upon receiving the request, the leader immediately writes the data to its local storage and responds with an OK without waiting for data synchronization to the backups. Once the client receives OK response from the leader and over three quarters of witnesses, it confirms that the operation is persistent. In a slow path, due to the witness rejection, the client needs to wait for the leader to synchronize the data to other follower backups and before achieving uh, consensus. We can illustrate how Curb achieve consensus with a simple example. Consider two commands, put Z5 and put Z7. When a user issued the first command as put Z, S5 doesn't conflict with the records in the witness, it entered the fast pass, requiring just one RTT. For the second for the uh, second command, since put Z7 conflict with the put Z5, uh, the witness rejects the client's request. Uh, consequently, the leader executes after sync. Uh, to synchronize the data for uh, to uh, follower backups within the cluster. Uh, once the majority followers complete the present uh, persistent, the leader responds successfully to the client, including uh, indicating that consensus has been reached. Uh, for consensus algorithm used in a production environment, rely, uh, relying solely on testing to ensure correctness is far from sufficient. We also need to establish the algorithm uh, correctness theoretically uh, through a process known as the formal vertification. So what exactly is formal vertification? Formal vertification is the act of uh, proving or disproving the correctness of intended algorithm underlying a system with respect to a certain formal specification or property using the formal methods of mathematics. In XNI, not only is the curve algorithm implemented, but it also provides a TLA plus proof for the curve algorithm for specific details, please refer to follower uh, following link. As the uh, mentioned uh, uh, <coughs> as mentioned earlier, the intermediate layer can be divided into the consensus module and the business module. So, how does these two modules interact? Uh, on a single note, the business server communicates with the curb server by initiating. Uh, uh, RPC request through its own curb client. Once the cluster reach uh, achieve consensus, the curb server will invoke the callback uh, of the business module. This callback method is defined within the command executor chain and is implemented by a business module. And here is uh, here are the RPC interface uh, interface definitions relevant to the curb module. Among these, propose is primarily intended for uh, external business servers to invoke. Business servers use propose to initiate uh, proposals to uh, the curb server. Uh, the remaining RPCs are 
many design uh, for communication between curb nodes within a cluster. Um, here is the uh, here are the curb external interface definitions, and the curb module provide three traits for inversion of control. The command command tray represents a specific command, and a valid command should include the following two aspects: the criteria for determining conflicts, and which phrase are involved, and the result pro Deuce by each phrase, and the sec uh, the conflict track chain describe how to co uh, how conflicts are determined between different commands. Command executor chain, the execution entity of a command describing the uh, specific execution process of different phrase of a command. The curb server doesn't concern itself with executing commands is only interesting in the relationship between between them and doesn't delve into the specifics of how commands are executed. On the other hand, a uh, command executor uh, describes how commands are executed without concerning itself with the relationship between commands. Each interface are separately, uh, separate. Se uh, separate, uh, focusing on uh, its respective aspect. <clears throat> and the entire curb server can be structurally, uh, uh, structurally uh, divided into two parts. One is the front-end curb nodes, and the other is the back-end row curb. The curb node uh, responds to RPC calls from the curb clients and forward the corresponding request to the backend raw curb for execution. And the raw curb, in, terms, in, in turn, uh, performs the different operation based on the type of the request. Uh, conflict track MPMC channel and uh, command workers are two core components of the curb service. So what are their responsibilities? Ah. Conflict track channel. It's an MPMC. It's a MPMC channel which guarantees there will be no conflict message received by multi receivers at the same time. The command workers uh, is receive the co commands from the channel and execute them. Let's consider uh, an example. Suppose there are three commands A, B, and C. And command A and B uh, conflict with each other, while command C doesn't uh, conflict with either A or B. The working process of the conflict tracking MPMC channel can be simplified as follow. Uh, of course. The working principle of the conflict, uh, config, uh, conflict track MPMC is not as straightforward as described. We will encounter the following two challenges. The first question is <clears throat> how to model the conflict relationships. We can use a DAG to model the relationships and the commands act as a vertex and the conflicting relationships act as ages. And the second question is how to find all non-conflicting commands. And we can transfer this uh, question into calculating the topological order of the connected component in the DAG. Once these two challenges are addressed, we can replace the buffer in the conflict check it MPMC channel with a DAG. And ultimately, the working process looks like
Now, let's describe how Kerp module achieve consensus. When a client initiate a proposal uh, propose request, the request first reach to the Kerp node. And the Kerp node invokes the handle propose to process the command. Since put uh, z equals to 5 uh, that uh, doesn't conflict with other commands, Rockerp insert this command into the conflict tracked MPMC channel. Uh, subsequently, uh, subsequently, command walker will retrieve uh, the command from the channel, execute it, store the execution result into the co uh, command board, and notify the curb node to send an OK response to the client. And after the client sends a request to the curb node, the curb node also uh, forwards the request to raw curb. However, since put Z7 conflict with the preceding put Z5, raw curb submitted command to the uh, sync task and return a key conflict arrow to the uh, curb node. The sync task wrap this command into a log entry and send append entries request to other followers within the cluster. Once all nodes have stored the lo this log entry, the curb server applies it. During the log application process, the command is sent to the channel and executed by command workers in execute and after sync stage. Only after this stage are complete does Kerp node receive the notification to send OK response to the client. And uh, XLI storage layer can be uh, divided into uh, two sub layers. The storage API layer and a storage engine layer. The storage API layer is responsible for uh, encapsulating low-level uh, storage interfaces into the business relevant interfaces. The underlying storage uh, engine uh, uh, layer corresponds to specific storage engines and essentially provides a thin layer of encapsulation for those storage engines in the form of a key value interface. Uh, when selecting a storage engine for an industrial grade metadata storage system, what factors should be considered? First and foremost, from uh, a functional perspective, uh, the chosen storage engine should provide transaction semantic uh, and uh, support basic uh, key value uh, operation and enable batch uh, processing uh, operation. Uh, next, from the maintenance standpoint, consideration should be given to the uh, backing supporters of the engine, prioritizing large commercial uh, companies or uh, an active open source communities. Additionally, the engine should be widely adopted uh, within the industry to provide a wealth of experience for debugging and tuning in later stage. Lastly, the engine should process a high level recognition and a popularity uh, measured by uh, GitHub starts to attract uh, to attractive excellent contributors and moving on the uh, moving on to performance as storage engines often become the bottlenecks in system performance uh, it's essential to select a high performance storage engine a high store uh, performance storage engine naturally requires coding in a high performance language uh, and should uh, favor uh, synchronized implementation prioritizing the Rust language followed by C or C++. Uh, finally, uh, from a development uh, perspective, 
uh, prioritizing implementation in the Rust language can reduce some additional development effort at this stage. And the priority order of these requirements are as, as follow. The functionality uh, is greater than the uh, maintenance. And maintenance is uh, greater than or equals to performance. And the performance is greater than uh, development. And uh, currently, the mainstream storage engine in the industry can be broadly uh, categorized into B plus tree based storage engine and LSM tree based storage engines. And their read write uh, 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 amplification uh, is as follow. And from the uh, above grave, uh, we can draw a conclusion that B plus tree based storage engines is. Uh, has a uh, lower uh, rate amplification, so it's uh, suitable for scenarios with more rates and fewer writes. And uh, LSM tree-based storage engines uh, have <coughs> has lower write amplification, so it's suitable for uh, scenarios with more writes and fewer reads. And however, due to the lack of the B tree, B plus tree storage engines widely used in the industry within the Rust ecosystem, XLI ultimately chose RocksDB based on the uh, LSM tree as the backend storage engine. Uh, for further uh, information on the design and trade offs of the persistent storage layer in XLI, please refer to the log, the design and implementation of the XLI persistent storage layer. Uh, okay, uh, let's discuss some topics related to the uh, distributed system testing. Uh, here are some uh, common pain points in testing distributed uh, system. Uh, as we all know, our distributed systems in reality often operate in unreliable environments, which can stem for from the following source, uh, like network uh, packet lost, uh, out of order delivery, network partition, timeouts, malicious attacks, uh, software like uh, software uh, issues like bug in uh, software may lead to a crash of the distributed node in instance and something like hardware problems, uh, hardware failure, uh, such as the power issues, cost no instance to crash. Uh, the mission of a distributed system is to achieve the full tolerance in such complex and unreliable environments to verify the uh, distributed system to, to verify the uh, distributed systems can tolerate errors within a reasonable range. A key aspect is testing and chaos engineering. However, testing a distributed system often encounter the following pain points, uh, a large number of test cases and long testing time and Hasenberg bugs. Uh, the, those errors that occurred in one moment may not be reproduced in the next. What you can do, what you can only do is run long and repetitively uh, repetitive tests to reproduce the issue. Uh, the author of SLAT has uh, published a blog post titled uh, SLAT Miss uh, Simulation Guide uh, on their website discussing how does uh, how SLAT conducts uh, conduct, conduct uh, testing. This article points out that the success of Jepson serve, uh, uh, serves as a continuous reminder that we have building distributed systems in a misguided manner. So what approach can truly be considered correct? Uh, the right approach has two steps. The step one is uh, write your code uh, in a way that can deterministically test it uh, on top of a simulator. And the step two is to build 
a simulator that will access, uh, exercise uh, realistic message passing behavior. Anyone who doesn't do this is building a very buggy distributed systems, as Jepson rapidly showed. A notable expectation is Foundation DB. Let's learn from their success and simulator. And uh, Metasim is a deterministic simulator. Uh, it's essentially a runtime with the key feature of a deterministic uh, simulation. Uh, its, funda uh, its fundamental unit is Node, uh, representing a simulated entity that can be associated with a network IP address. Using the API to provide by uh, Metasim, it becomes uh, possible to control various states of a specific node. As the code snippet show above, the init, uh, the uh, the init method uh, receives an initial task and when the node uh, restarts it, it will run the task again to simulate uh, the functionality of restart after a node crash so how does the medicine uh, simulate deterministic uh, and currently medicine is primarily used to uh, uh, stimulate randomness a network and timers in XLI. Uh, for network communications in Metasim, it utilizes an implementation called Endpoint. An Endpoint doesn't use the actual IP address and port, but instead use uh, channels to simulate data communication in memory. Each Endpoint can be bounded to any valid IP address and port and can send data to other Endpoints. The routing in Metasim allowed connecting any IP address. Metasim is also provide a simulated timer and clock. Ah, this uh, simulate timer records events, and the time in Metasim runtime is not a real time, but it's instead advanced by the runtime to simulate the system clock. After running each task, the Metasim runtime will invoke advance to next event to progress the system clock and trigger expired timer events. And how uh, Metasim, how does Metasim reproduce the Hasenberg box? And Metasim uh, provides, uh, Metasim use a random number C to produce the system's environment uh, when Hasenberg bug uh, occurred. Uh, there are two steps. Uh, the step one is to obtain the corresponding seed uh, when a Hasenberg bug occurs. And the step two is to use the environment variable Madison test seed to set a seed for the corresponding test case. Like this. <clears throat> and Madison, uh when creating the uh, runtime, uh, a specific uh, uh, seed needs to be uh, specified to uh, medicine uh, and this runtime will use this seed to create a global random number generator and override the Lipsy's uh, random function ensuring that all the uh, random number in the runtime are deterministically uh, generated from this seed Additionally, all I/O operations in the runtime, including the uh, time, uh, timer, and uh, network status and extension, are uh, derived from this seed. So, therefore, once this seed is determined, the system running state is fixed, ensuring that the same seed will produce the same result each time it runs. And how to uh, integrate uh, Metasim into your project? And there are three steps and using the Metasim components to eliminate uh, uncertainties in your integration test, like a random generator, time, Tokyo, extension. And the step two is to substitute the integration test macros with the uh, Metasim's test macros and set the Metasim uh, as the corresponding runtime. But here's one thing you should know. Uh, you need to convert certain interfaces with external dependency into side-effect-free interface. 
interfaces. For example, Medicine Tonic does no uh, provide a serve with incoming method uh, which accept an uh, external stream, uh, since the stream may originate from outside of Medicine. Uh, it could uh, introduce side effects beyond Medicine's control. Uh, that wraps up my presentation, and if you are uh, and if you like to learn more details about XLI, please feel free to visit the repository and website. And thank you all for your time and attention.